I think that we hardly have an inkling as to the real nature of the world and the real history of life on this planet. And, you know, we don't know uh, how narrowly channeled the manifestation of organic intelligence is. Does it always have to be in a body? Does it always have to be in a body that stands upright with binocular vision? I think the real task with dealing with extraterrestrials is to know when you've got one. It's completely silly to search the galaxy with radio telescopes for uh, a radio civilization. I mean, to my mind, that is as chuckle-headed as deciding you're going to search the galaxy for a decent Italian restaurant. I mean, it, it, it doesn't work like that. So, uh, you know, the, if you think about the mushroom, uh, try to think about it objectively, it looks to me very much like a good candidate for an extraterrestrial. First of all, you know, DNA has been known to us only since 1950, less than a century, and we're already involved in this thing called the Human Genome Project. Well, the real, what that means is we are taking control of the scripts that write human beings. It seems to me anything we would recognize as intelligence would pass through a phase of self-analysis where it would realize that it was made out of DNA and would then sequence itself. We're about to do this ourselves. Well, that means that most extraterrestrials will be the product of their own um, reflexive design process. In other words, a, an extraterrestrial that can cross the gulf between the stars must surely then be able to control its own form. Well then, if you look at the mushroom, it's a curious combination of artifact and entity. It looks sort of manufactured. There's very little fat on that system. I mean, first of all, uh, fungi are primary decomposers. This means that they are at the very bottom of the food chain. This makes the kind of vegetarianism espoused by Buddhists look like an orgy of slaughter, you know? Because if you're, if you're at the very bottom of the food chain, that is the only place that is absolutely karma-free. So there's the mushroom, in the, occupying the karma-free position in the food chain. Well then, it's, you know, we've been reading about these huge mycelial clones spread under acres of soil in Michigan and Wyoming. Well, those things, what that is, is that's a cobweb-like network, and in the case of a psilocybin species, filled with neurotransmitter-like compounds. Can you imagine how many synaptic clamps there must be in a 1,500-acre mushroom clone? If, if brain size is any relationship to intelligence, then hang on, Hannah, because uh, it means that this thing spread through the forests of the Midwest uh, has, you know, a brain approximate in weight to... Uh, a couple of dozen gray whales. Uh, the other thing is then the spore looks perfectly designed to sustain itself in outer space. If you want to store spores for longevity, you create conditions as close to the conditions in outer space as you possibly can. High vacuum, very low temperature. Uh, the casing of a spore is one of the most electron-dense organic materials in nature. So electron-dense that it approximates a metal. Well, global currents can form on the quasi-metallic surface of an airborne spore, and they act as a further uh, repellent for hard radiation. So, and, you know, percolating through the galaxy at an ordinary rate typical of stellar material, a, a mushroom species could percolate from one side of the galaxy to the other in under 400,000 years. Well, that's lightning speed uh, compared to the size and age of the universe. 
if we were to gain the power to design ourselves, I think after a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, you know, Madonna and Robert Redford clones, we would probably move on to becoming something very much like a mushroom. It's, you know, mild, it's non-invasive, it's at the bottom of the food chain, it's virtually immortal, it's laden with neurotransmitters, and it's living in the imagination. And this, you know, brings me to a favorite subject of mine. This is where we have to go. We have to enter into the Blakean divine imagination. That's where our future lies. Uh, at this point, our relationship to this planet as infant to child is a relationship of impending toxemia. We have to be parted from the mother to save the mother and to save us. And there are not that many possibilities. Where are we going to go? The political geniuses who run this planet have made uh, migration to the stars virtually impossible. I mean, don't kid yourself, it isn't only a matter of announcing a program. Our short, stubby fingers couldn't assemble something like a Saturn V moon rocket. That was made by a generation of people now deceased. Americans in this uh, era are, you know, rather dull-witted people who have a good deal of trouble even running a third world economy. So we're not going to the stars. You can forget that. Uh, so then where are we going? Well, uh, nanotech, is that a possibility? Could, can we download everybody into a supercooled cube of gold deuterium alloy buried 500 feet deep in the center of Copernicus? And then we'll go there and leave the earth and dance forever in the hallways of the astral imagination. That's one possibility. Another possibility is, is there a way to diffuse consciousness into the environment. Can we become dolphins, caterpillars, gray whales, and mosquitoes, and just sort of defocus ourselves? And, I mean, all of these are, of course, wildly radical notions. But on the other hand, we're headed straight toward a brick wall at about 5,000 miles an hour. We have to figure out something pretty uh, astonishing in a hurry. Yeah. Yes, uh, another thing about the function of the drying of the mushroom is you'll notice that it shapes nice and furry and pretty into the atmosphere. <laughs> 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 the heat shield. <laughs> yes, precisely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can you 